Good evening. Bruchim Habaim, good evening. I am Sharon Levin, head of school at the Jack M. Barrick Hebrew Academy. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome everyone this evening as we honor Michelle and Rob Levin for their contributions to our school and to Eretz Yisrael. And as we celebrate the miracle of the first Jewish state in two millennia, the establishment of the modern state of Israel 70 years ago. In 1946, two years before the existence of the state, our school was founded with a deeply Zionist mission and philosophy. For over 70 years, our students have studied the richness of Israel's history and culture, and the study of Ivrit, the Hebrew language, has always been at the cornerstone of an Akiba Barak education. Our students forge lifelong connections to Israel, and today, over 170 of our alumni live there. As I stand here tonight, our eighth graders are hopefully fast asleep in their hotel rooms in Tel Aviv. Towards the end of their trip, a trip where they are experiencing what they have learned about Israel in our classrooms over their middle school years. We are most proud, though, that for 35 years, half of the life of the modern state, we have been sending our 11th graders to study in Israel, the last 25 years of which have been with the Alexander Muss High School. I have had the amazing opportunity to be with our students at Muss, to journey with them to places throughout the country and to watch as the biblical passages and documents they study in the classroom come alive on their tiulim, their journeys through the land. Theodor Herzl said, in tirtzu enzo agada, if you will it, it is no dream. And our students are experiencing that dream each year on Mus. Our goal in all aspects of our Israel studies, our studies in the classroom, our Israel programming, and our Israel travels is to inspire and engage our students so they graduate from Barrack as intellectually confident and ethically responsible young adults. A young adults who have gained knowledge and sophistication on modern Israeli issues so that they are prepared for the kinds of dialogue they will encounter after their barrack years. To give this evening's Devar Torah, it is my pleasure to introduce John Cohen, one of our students who, as our tagline says, loves where he learns, and who, as an 11th grader on Musk this past fall, has had the opportunity to also live what he learned. John. This week's parasha is Vayikra, and the start of the third book of Torah. In this parasha, God calls to Moses and tells him in great detail the laws of the korbanot, the sacrificial offerings. The word korban comes from the root kuf resh bet, meaning to get close to. Now this is obviously fitting because the whole point of, of korbanot was to become closer to God. Now, 3,000 years later, without the temple and without sacrificial offerings, the state of Israel has become even more important in bringing us closer to God. If there is anything that the last 2,000 years of Jewish history has taught us, it's that without the state of Israel, Judaism can survive and not much else. Sure, we'll have a good 100 years of prosperity here and there, but Judaism has never been stronger than when we have our own autonomous state. 
So, with much of Judaism centered on Israel, what are the necessary things we as Jews do to help the state of Israel and to strengthen our connection to it? To answer my own question, we pray, with many of these prayers directed towards or even facing Israel. We donate, maybe we plant a tree through JNF or buy an Israeli bond. We advocate on college campuses or to our congressmen. And of course, we learn. We educate ourselves on Israel's history and importance. We even, we even visit Israel and see through our own eyes what can only be described as awesomeness. Between morning minyanim, Jewish studies and Tanakh classes, an Israel programming period, and most JLI activities, Barak students are constantly making great strides towards connecting with Israel. And as a part of the Jewish community as a whole, we give and show our support for, for Israel in basically any way possible. And while we're not exactly sacrificing cattle and oxen anymore, we are in fact making real sacrifices. Learning both the ancient and nuanced modern history of Israel, of mo modern history of Israel can be difficult and very time consuming. Taking political action can be beyond frustrating. Oftentimes trying to support Israel is no easy feat, and many of you have learned this firsthand. You have made an incredible sacrifice to send us to Barak and to Israel through Mus. But for all the sacrifices we make for Israel, they're all worth it. My classmates and I had the amazing opportunity to spend this year's first trimester in Israel. A conglomeration of everything we had learned for years in day school came together as we experienced the history of our ancestors and learned why Israel is so great and so important. Everything we learned and experienced came as a result of all of your sacrifices. One day we too can make our own sacrifices, make our own difference, and try as best as we can to main these, maintain, maintain these valuable connections. So, as Vayikra teaches us, there are many different kinds of korbanot one can make, each with their own difficulties and caveats, each one of them moving another step closer to God. Meanwhile, our own sacrifices, great or small, all contribute to keeping the Zionist dream alive, and yes, they all help us to become a little bit closer to Israel and Judaism as a whole. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. Thank you all for coming. We are so grateful for your support and such a strong showing of community and support for our honorees, Michelle and Rob. My name is George Gordon. I'm president of the board of the Jack M. Barrick Hebrew Academy. My, my wife, Tracy, and I are the proud parents of three Barrick graduates and one current, hopefully soon, graduating senior. <laughs> it's amazing to be here this evening with so many members of our Barrick family, celebrating the school, celebrating Israel, and celebrating our school's deep connection with Israel, particularly through the MUS program. Like it is for so many in the Barrick community, MUS is personal for us. The MUS program has had a significant impact on our family. I think each of our children would tell you that their time at MUS made an indelible mark on their lives, pro providing them with a deep connection and a lasting love for the Jewish homeland. And MUS is not just about giving our students a grounding in Israeli politics, life, history, and culture. On MUS, our students develop independence and life skills. They come back different people, having turned a corner towards becoming strong and independent young adults. I could go on all night about Barrick, about Mus, and about our kids, but I won't. The Barrick and Mus alum do a much better job than I, have, I could ever do. So let's go to the tape. We were in a foreign country. We were 16 years old. It was a new program for the school. I just don't think you can get any better education. It made us who we were. MUS was my foundation of knowledge for myself about Israel. That encouraged me to pursue answers to the question regarding my Judaism and my connection to the Jewish state. When you're in Israel, you're exploring, you're traveling, and you're also studying and understanding all of the layers of depth that make it that much more beautiful. Before I went on MUS, I had never really thought about what the reality of this country is like in a critical fashion. I'd say my connection to Israel was 
first sparked because of Jewish Day School, because of being at Barrack. Israel serves as a great common denominator between the entire community at Barrack and being able to understand that everyone will have a different perspective, everyone will have a different opinion, but at the end of the day, there's this undying support and love for the Jewish state. Whenever we would plan an event, plan a ceremony, plan something for Yom HaTzmaut to make it meaningful to everyone else at Barrack, it allowed me to make Yom HaTzmaut as much like it is in Israel as possible. One of the things that Barrack values is getting out in the world, meeting people, getting to know people, understanding different perspectives. And a really great way to do that is to go to Israel. One of the things that I really liked about Bus was you would learn something in the classroom and then you would actually go and see it. We're crawling through these caves and then we're in the middle of the cave and everyone has their flashlights on and all of a sudden it was like these were the caves where people would hide and learn Torah and we were sitting in there and we were learning about Israel and the history. Masada was really an amazing time of combining what we're learning and where we were going. One of the most powerful moments was leaving Poland, arriving back in Israel, and to really experience what it felt like, give us a whole new perspective on the country and being in the land. It was the first and only time that I went to Yad Vashem. I just remember coming out of there crying by the end of it, just because it's such a powerful experience. Definitely one of the best parts of the MUST program was uh, Yam Liam. It's a hike where you go from the Mediterranean Sea to the Sea of the Galilee. When you're walking during the day, there's not much to do other than just talk with people. This one hike really forged bonds between everyone within the class. Everyone always talks about when you come home from us, the grade's so close and everyone's friends, and that's a really special thing. I think it taught me how to live on my own and to really immerse myself into the Jewish culture. Being able to pray among thousands of Jewish people in Jerusalem, you know, standing with my classmates, finishing up the last minutes, of Yom Kippur, and then just celebrating afterwards it was such a moving experience. We were matched with an Israeli family. Once you're outside of the campus, you can actually experience the way that Israelis are living every day. So you get to have dinner with the family, you get to go out with the kids. You know, what happens on the program is really amazing, but the impact after the program is in many ways even more amazing. Being able to develop my connection to Israel in that kind of safe environment has given me all the comfort that I need to express that in the not so safe environment of college. I'm part of a group on campus called Students Supporting Israel. We try to change the story on campus of Israel so that people understand why the Jewish people have a connection to the land of Israel. Barak and Musk provide me with the skills, confidence, and actual knowledge to be able to found a chapter of the Tamid group at Duke, which offers the ability for students on campus to engage with the Israeli startup economy. Musk taught me that I could be an independent person living in this country. I knew how to speak the language already through my education at Barak. Following college, I worked for the Israeli government for three years, and at the end of the three years, I made Aliyah. I live in Tel Aviv, where I work work in a high-tech startup. When I came back after college to be a madrich on list, I just completely re-fell in love with the country. Plus, I realized that I wanted to teach at the MUST program as a profession, and all these things together, I kind of realized that my future was clearly in Israel. We had our 30th reunion, I guess, a year or two ago. We actually Skyped with some of our classmates who are in Israel and some in California. So that was also incredible. My time on bus strengthened my base and my core beliefs to the point where I was able to keep them in focus to move here and be here, which I've now done. Yeah, I mean, after experiencing something like that, how could I not go back?
Good evening. My name is Jake Levin. Uh, this is my sister, Sammy, my brother, Andrew. Uh, we're probably known better to all of you as the children of Michelle and Rob, so it's how I've been introducing myself my whole life. So, um, Having attended public school through eighth grade, my parents informed me in the summer of 2007 that I would be attending Barrack Hebrew Academy. At the time, it was known as Akiba. To put it lightly, I was not thrilled about the change. Uh, I didn't know anyone at the school. To be honest, I was a little bit of a troublemaker, so I didn't know how you know, the personalities would mesh there. <laughs> However, within a few months, I remember feeling strangely at ease and comfortable at the school. I uh, had an intrinsic connection with my classmates that I just didn't feel in public school. My parents observed this transition and how positive it was, and I imagine they had a conversation that went something al along the lines of this. Wow, if the school can turn this kid around, we have to send every other kid <laughs> that we have there as well as get involved in the community. So, um, you know, it ended up being a great decision because I, as well as my siblings, I think, have made some amazing connections both here and in Israel that will last a lifetime. Um, you know, personally, I've been back in Israel multiple times since graduating, and, uh, you know, the school and, you know, Israel itself is, are, are very dear to my heart. So, since that time, I have seen the impact that my parents have made on the community. Uh, it started really early when my classmates would just randomly, uh, randomly start coming up to me and saying, oh, hey, Jake, your mom is here. And I say, oh, God, what did I do this time? Uh, but uh, it turns out she was there for other reasons. Uh, over time, I started to hear and observe the amazing things that both of my parents were doing at the school. I even had the pleasure of watching my mother give a speech at graduation a couple years ago as the president of the school, which was very special for me. And, you know, throughout our whole life, supporting Israel and supporting com the community has been a huge priority in our family. And the older I get, the more I appreciate and respect the example that my parents have set forth for us. Uh, it's been an honor to be raised by two such amazing people. And the only thing that I can wish is that the three of us can carry on the legacy that they have made. As the youngest child of the Levin family, I saw my brother and sister, my brother and sister transition into the community and gain an incredible love for Israel. I saw them mature as siblings and young adults. And when I started at Barrack, I was excited uh, for the same experience. One of the things I most looked forward to was going on the MUST program. After years of eagerly waiting, I had the privilege of traveling to Israel with my 11th grade class in 2014. The thing I found most interesting about MUS was that while most barrack students went on the program, every grade and every individual had their own unique experiences. While I didn't realize it at the time, MUS had a profound impact on who I am and my love for Israel. It taught me the importance of being independent, being Jewish, and being part of a community. The best way to describe my parents is by their passions. Their passion for Israel and their family, mostly our dog, Charlie. <laughs> my mom's passion for improving the community, learning, and Candy Crush. <laughs> my dad's passion for his business, baseball, and of course, a nice glass of scotch. In 2012, my parents combined many of these passions by helping to build a baseball field in Meor, a small agricultural community between Tel Aviv and Haifa. This field, dedicated to our late grandfather, Alvin, has helped to fuel a growing interest in baseball in Israel. It is this passion for our community and the greater community that I will carry with me through college and beyond. Over the years, we have watched your love and passion for supporting Israel flourish. As we grew up, that devotion has seeped into each of, each of our lives. Each one of us has had a unique experience and connection to Israel, built on the principles you have taught us and the love you have instilled in us. I have brought this passion with me in each step of my life. From my first trip to Israel in seventh grade, to my semester on Mus, the experiences you have granted me have helped me grow as an individual, a student, and a leader. 
I have brought this confidence with me throughout high school and to college where I grew to be a leader in the Pitt Jewish community and now as an adult in postgraduate life. The leadership you've inspired in us is what has made us who we are today. Leading by example and showing us confidence in our beliefs and values allows us to share them with those around us. This rewards us the opportunity to learn from others, keep an open mind, and make tough decisions into moral learning experiences. This is a legacy that is ingrained in us and that we look forward to sharing with generations to come. We continue to be so incredibly proud of you, so humbled by all that you have accomplished, and so grateful for all that you have taught us. Thank you for being the greatest parents and truly inspiring us in every aspect of our lives. Okay, it's award time. Uh, the Jack M. Barrick Hebrew Academy Legacy and Leadership Award recognizes individuals who exemplify the core Jewish values upon which our school was founded. And who better to receive this award than Michelle and Rob, whose lives and actions embody, embody everything that Barrick stands for. Both here in Philadelphia and in Israel, you have been elevating those around you for years. Through your work and your philanthropy, you improve lives and you strengthen community. Our entire Bear community counts itself privileged to be among the thousands of people whose lives you've touched, inspired, and elevated. This award was created by Laura Lynn Stern for, from our visual arts program. It's a handmade glass model of Israel mounted on a laser-cut, hand-painted image of Philadelphia. It represents your deep commitment to Jewish causes both in Philadelphia and in Israel. And if anyone gets a chance, you should really take a look at it. It's really quite something. We hope you display this award proudly in your home as a symbol of how proud we are of you, how much we appreciate you, and everything you do for our community. So Michelle and Rob, come on up. And please join me in thanking our honorees, Michelle and Rob Levin, we so richly deserve our Legacy and Leadership Award. Good evening. I am Rob Levin. I'm Michelle's husband. And I'm the one that's better suited for being only seen and never heard, and most of the time never heard, but this time I was told it's my turn. So I'm gonna do my best, and I promise to be on my best behavior, but I can't guarantee it. Uh, I think the last time that I gave any sort of speech whatsoever was at Andrew's Bar Mitzvah, half dozen or so years ago, so I guess every six years or so I can squeeze one out. First, Michelle and I want to thank everyone for coming to tonight's gala. It's a very impressive crowd, and I want to thank everybody for coming out to see me. Uh, this is, a, a, of course, a very, very great cause, and we are touched to be honored and recognized for our family's accomplishments. Now. In keeping with what I do best, I'm going to make a toast. Um, our families, Michelle's and mine, and the, those who came before us, uh, journeyed, like many of uh, everybody in this room and everywhere else, to this country and against great odds. They settled in, they worked hard, and they built community. Our grandparents and parents nurtured us and nudged us, molded us, and demonstrated for us, and demanded high standards of us. They exemplified virtue, emphasized education and culture, guided us, supported us, and set us on a path towards greater knowledge and understanding, high morals, great empathy, love for our country, love for Israel community and family. values all 
we energetically and enthusiastically imbue to our children. As recipients of the Legacy and Leadership Award, we proudly and graciously accept on behalf of those giants who came before us and those who come after us and now pick up the mantle and carry it forward while also teaching us along the way. Thank you. So, I don't drink that. <laughs> Jewish day school was not our plan. As young newlyweds, we bought our first home in Ballo Kimwood specifically so our children would go to Lower Marion High School. We planned, God laughed. To clarify, as Jake shared, each of our children transferred to Barrack in their ninth grade year. Jake, now 25, as he expressed, went kicking and screaming. Sammy, now 22, said she would try it for one year. And Andrew, a sophomore at Boston University, and here, fortunately, even with the weather, resigned himself to the idea, seeing no other option. <laughs> As secular diaspora Jews, our children were certainly not begging for this holistic Jewish experience. This decision was made by us for them as their parents. I don't know if it was luck, fate, or the guidance of a higher being that led our family on this amazing and eye-opening journey. I just know that our Akiba Barrack experience has been incredibly influential and impactful on all of us. I've been blessed with a family that has supported my many philanthropic adventures over the years. As Rob is so proud of saying, he is the world's worst mommy. As daily duties were juggled to allow for my many weeks spent traveling to Israel and around the world to visit and support Jewish communities and programs. I think of Rob and myself as willing and hardworking participants and team players. I never thought of us as leaders. We simply do what feels right and what should be expected of us as members of the tribe. I was raised by parents who taught me Jews support Jews. My parents traveled to Israel often when I was young. Unfortunately, they have been gone for many years, and among my biggest disappointments is never having experienced a multi-generational trip to Israel with them. Fortunately, Rob's mom, Marcy, who is here with us celebrating this evening, was able to join us when we chaired the 2012 Jewish Federation mega mission to Israel. Long ago, Rob and I made a conscious decision to prioritize Israel and Jewish education in our philanthropic endeavors. Barrick has offered us a platform that combines both of these passions. It has been our honor to support this school and incredibly life-changing programs offered, such as the Alexander Muss High School in Israel. Our family's legacy of love and support for the state of Israel is a reality because we partnered with Barrick to educate our children, and they just get it. They understand all that is at stake. They are passionately Zionistic and well-informed on matters related to daily life and geopolitics. Jake, Sammy, and Andrew, you make us so proud each and every day, and we know that Grandma Natalie, Grandpa Ben, and Grandpa Al are watching over and confounding seeing all of us. And we especially know they're happy because the Eagles finally won the Super Bowl. <laughs> we want to thank all of you for being here this evening and supporting this amazing institution. We truly appreciate the love and generosity that fills this room. Thank you to the school for bestowing this award honor on us. Being recognized for leadership and legacy is both incredibly meaningful and overwhelming. In our hearts, we surely receive more than we give. Thank you. And now, I have the honor of introducing our keynote speaker, Ambassador Dory Gold. Dr. Gold, Dr. Gold was born and educated in the United States. After receiving his master's at his MA, PhD from Columbia University, he became an Israeli citizen in 1980 and served in the IDF. 
He's a renowned expert on Middle Eastern affairs, a best-selling author, and an accomplished diplomat. During his career as the Prime Minister of Israel's foreign policy advisor, and later as ambassador to the United Nations, Dr. Gold distinguished himself in negotiations with world leaders, which included the President of the United States, the U.S. Secretary of State, and the British Foreign Secretary. He also served as a special envoy to the leaders of Arab states. In 1991, Gold served as advisor to the Israeli delegation at the Madrid Peace Conference. From June of 96 to June of 97, he was the foreign policy advisor to Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Gold accompanied Netanyahu to meetings with the Jordanian leadership in 94 and 95, and as foreign policy advisor under Netanyahu after the 96 elections, Gold acted as a special envoy to the Palestinian Authority, Egypt, Jordan, and others in the Arab world. He was also involved in the negotiations leading up to the Hebron Agreement and the note for the record. He served in 1997 as the Israeli ambassador to the UN, and in 2015 he became director general of the Israeli Foreign Ministry. Wow. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dory Gold. Before I get started, I just want to say it is a real inspiration when one comes to the diaspora and sees a strong community like your community here in Philadelphia. And You know, the Jewish people is relatively small. And in Israel, we're even smaller. But if you know that you have a Jewish community with strength behind you, it gives you the strength to do the things that Israel must do. So um, it goes noticed. You know, over the last number of years, it became customary for both critics and supporters of Israel to sense, to say something, that Israel is looking increasingly isolated. I think this largely becomes a, an observation due to the voting patterns in various UN bodies. If you look at the votes in the UN General Assembly, you'll find every year at least about 20 resolutions where the votes are you know, 100 condemning Israel and two states or three states supporting us. Why this occurs is a complex story of, how would I put this, um, block voting. I call it a notorious block voting, in which, let's say, the Palestinians who want to try to take a move that puts Israel in an awkward position internationally, talk to the Arab states. The Arab states there then turn to the Islamic group at the United Nations. And then the Islamic group turns to a group called the Non-Aligned Movement. Maybe I guess you're too young here to remember when the Non-Aligned Movement was formed. It was formed in the 1950s as a movement of third world countries that were neither aligned with the United States or with the Soviet Union. But they remain a voting bloc at the UN and all of a sudden on issues related to Israel, you get 140 countries with the Non-Aligned Movement voting against us. And it makes it very difficult. Now. Recently, we've had a number of votes, not just in the UN General Assembly, in the Security Council, in other UN bodies like UNESCO in Paris. And they've been some of the most hostile and difficult resolutions that Israel has faced. For example, UNESCO's resolutions in 2016 began talking about Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, and began talking about the Temple Mount, Harabayit, in language they never used before. They were only using the Islamic term for talking about Harabayit itself. 
they would speak about al Haram al Sharif, or they would call it Al Aqsa. But the words Temple Mount dropped out of the vocabulary of the United Nations. And that wasn't the only case where we faced difficult, challenging resolutions. Now, you may not see this in your local papers, but in Israel, we see it all the time. It's reported in all our newspapers, and therefore, Israelis become aware that in the General Assembly, it's us and Micronesia. And every so often, we used to get countries in Latin America that would join. But the votes were very difficult. Lately, however, we've seen the beginnings of a very important change. And the change began with the mood that we were seeing in certain Arab states. As Director General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I used to take delegations of our diplomats to various parts of the Arab world. And I have to describe to you one dialogue I had with an Arab state, with their foreign ministry, and I wish I could identify the country, but it would be a, a break of confidence with this, with this particular Arab country. So I walk into the room with the Israeli delegation. We sit down, and we're facing this Arab delegation on the other side. Now, in, normally, when you go to these kinds of diplomatic meetings, your staff prepares for you talking points, bullets, eight bullets, 13 bullets, of what are the issues you're supposed to bring up. So I took my paper down, and I put it on the table. My counterpart did the same thing. He put his paper down on the table. And he said to me, you know what, Dory? You start. And so I start going through our bullets, our points. One, two, three, four, five. And I see this grin on my counterpart's face. And I'm thinking, did I do something wrong? Did I violate diplomatic protocol? Somebody did something that was funny, and therefore I see this uh, look of amusement. So I ask him, is something wrong, Muhammad? And he says, no, but your bullets, your talking points, are identical to my talking points. And by the way, on both, well, on his paper in particular, there was one difference. The, the subject of our negotiations with the Palestinians was his last item. In other words, there were so many other mutual interests that were emerging. And I said, our reality has really changed. During the uh, last number of years, we found ourselves moving around the Arab world and in the Islamic world as well. As far as countries in the Far East, which I cannot mention, to countries in Africa, two countries I can mention, we resumed diplomatic relations with a country called Guinea on the African coast of the Atlantic Ocean. We normally call it Guinea Conakry after the capital a completely Islamic country. I met the representative of the president in Paris, and we signed the resumption of diplomatic relations. I reached another country where my visit was made public. The other ones were mostly secret. It's called Chad. To remind you of the geography of Africa, Chad is just below Libya, just next to Sudan, and it's in an area called the Sahel, right under the Sahara Desert. I remember in Chad, I arrived in the capital, and the president of Chad, who I was supposed to see, Idris Deby, said, I'd like you to come to my hometown. I go, where's your hometown? He says, well, my hometown is an oasis in the Sahara Desert. It's 1,300 kilometers northward. <laughs> I was going to take my bicycle and go there. <laughs> so he sends us his air aircraft. We all get in with the head of military intelligence of Chad, and we fly to the oasis. 
We get off the, uh, off the aircraft. I have to say, his army, who was supposed to protect us, looked like Mujahideen from Afghanistan. <laughs> Not very comforting, but we went. We went to his marble house in the desert. And I sat with some of his assistants before we sat with the president himself. And I said, why are you guys warming up relations with us now? And then I first said, you know what? Why did you break relations in 1972? What happened? There was no Arab-Israeli war. It wasn't 73. It wasn't 67. Why did you break with us back then? And so he said, why did we break with you? Gaddafi in Libya. And then he said to me, well, today there's no Gaddafi and there's no Libya. <laughs> so you're here. <laughs> And these are the opportunities that are opening up for Israel that I can just tell you about. There are many more. And our relations are really warming with large parts of the world. Now, when you start being able to move around the Arab world, and it's reported in the newspaper, countries that give you a hard time have no more excuses. I asked a, an African foreign minister what's the most challenging country for Israel in Africa today? They said, South Africa. That's the hard nut to crack. So I said to my team in the foreign ministry, pack your bags, we're going to Pretoria. And we went to South Africa. We did our, we visited the home of Nelson Mandela. We did all the things we were supposed to do. And we actually found the beginnings of an opening. Now, what do you do when you're representing Israel abroad? One of the things you do is you take all your technologies. One of the things that interests them is that Israel has the best water desalination systems in the world. You know, if you're in a, if you're in a South African city and they set up a big desalination plant, well, what happens to all the people who are in the countryside? We now have desalination systems that are the size of a little Volkswagen bus. And we can get to a village and immediately start desalinating water or taking water that's murky, green, doesn't look very attractive, and have drinking water come out of a machine in five minutes. So you bring that on an iPad, you show it to people. But what I also found is that you have to have a common narrative. You have to be able to talk to people and have some kind of basis for clicking on almost an ideological level. The South Africans like to charge Israel with supporting apartheid in South Africa. We sold weapons to the South African army like the French did and the British did and others. And we didn't get involved in riot control which was the heart of the hard line of the previous regime. One of the things I learned during that visit, and maybe this is something about our Jewish character, we the Jewish people like to reach out to the downtrodden to try and help. The main political party in South Africa is called the African National Congress, the ANC. That's the party of Nelson Mandela. And I discovered during my visits that there was a farm outside of Johannesburg where members of the ANC would undergo military training. I had no idea what I'm about to tell you. I had no idea of it before I visited. There were old Jewish communists there. And one of them, who was in his 90s, wanted to meet me. He wasn't particularly a big fan of Israel, but they worked with the ANC and tried to train them. And these guys received help after 1948 from, from volunteers from Israel who had fought in the Palmach, in Sahal. So we were actually not on the side of the white minority. We were working with an African National Liberation Movement. 
And that became useful information because when you sit with, an Afri with a South African foreign minister and you feel like you have nothing in common, you can suddenly speak about this. So I'll share with you one other piece of information I learned in my travels. You know, um, Nelson Mandela, during a certain period, was hiding out on that farm. He was hiding out in a Jewish home. Now, to pass the time, he wasn't going to watch cable television. There was none. To pass the time, he was a voracious reader. And in this Jewish home, he picked up a book and read it. It was a book called The Revolt by Menachem Begin, which allowed me to tell South African diplomats, the head of your National Liberation Movement read a book by the head of my National Liberation Movement. And again, you create a common narrative. You create some, it's not just about water desalination systems. It's about being able to appreciate your civilization and its, and its help to their civilization. We sat down with the South Africans and signed a number of memoranda, a number of treaties. And we had photographs taken. So I did something a little sneaky. I said to my guys, send this to the PR department at the foreign ministry. And right underneath, while Israel is called an apartheid state in Amherst, Massachusetts, and in Berkeley, California, the Jewish state is signing agreements of cooperation with post-apartheid South Africa. And we use social media distribution to get this all over the place. There is a change in the world that is going on. We even took a team to Abu Dhabi. In 2009, Abu Dhabi wanted to get the uh, headquarters of a new uh, organization, a new organization for energy that it was creating. And it was Germany versus Abu Dhabi. In the end, Abu Dhabi got the headquarters. But there was a problem with the Israeli representation. All the other countries could use their embassies in, in the United Arab Emirates. We didn't have an embassy. We had nothing. So they allowed us to open a full diplomatic office in Abu Dhabi for that organization. It's not for the United Arab Emirates. But it was a way of get, give, getting Israel on the shores of the Persian Gulf. And this was all happening just in the last three or four years. So when you go to an African country and you ask, well, are you, going, are you willing to upgrade your relations with Israel? And they start shifting in their seats. And then you say, well, look, I just came from Abu Dhabi. We're in the heart of the Arab world. If we can go to Abu Dhabi, why can't we come to Africa? No argument. So it's part of a revolution that's occurring. And I could talk about this for hours, what's going on in Latin America when some of the most hostile leaders in Argentina or in Brazil are gone and new opportunities are there for Israel, or the evangelical community in Brazil is growing, they even built their own model of the temple. Things are happening. And Israel is not isolated. Something else is also happening. We're all facing mutual threats. Israel today is probably one of the leading experts, beside all the agriculture and, and, and water pure, uh, desalination we do. Israel is one of the leading experts in understanding the phenomenon of ISIS, what's called Daesh in Arabic, the organization of Abu Musa al zarqawi which the United States defeated in Syria and in Iraq. But you now have still, you still have a global Daesh threat, a threat from ISIS. And somebody has to get a, a um, create a map of their influence and their power in Africa, in Asia. And these countries turn to Israel for understanding the phenomenon. You know, in Europe today, the greatest fear is no longer Soviet armored divisions that are going to come rolling across Germany or Czechoslovakia. 
The greatest fear are the waves of refugees coming from the Middle East, from Syria and Iraq, millions of people. It's changing how Europe, what Europe looks like. But why are those people running? They've been running from organizations like Daesh, like ISIS. And therefore, understanding those dynamics just doesn't affect the security of the Middle East or of, or of Muslim countries in Africa or in, the, or in the Far East. It affects the security of Germany, of France. And therefore, they want to talk to Israel. Now, they can still give us a headache. And the European Union treats us with a double standard. But they're holding that back increasingly and they want better cooperation with Israel. I'll say something else about foreign policy. What I did at the UN, what we did in various parts of the world, our Jewish ethics, our Jewish morality, has been based on a combination of Jewish particularism, that is worrying about ourselves, which we should be doing, and Jewish universalism, our desire to be involved with the world. And I think for us today, for the state of Israel, part of what we have to do is define that mix for the Jewish state. And it is extremely exciting to be a part of that, a part of that effort to define our role. You know, I've been engaging, besides doing these kind of things, in helping defend Israel's position in Jerusalem. I have put together a multimedia presentation on our rights in Jerusalem. And in doing so, you know, you relearn things that you should have maybe understood years ago, but you only begin to understand them. You know, when we had Beit HaMikdash, the temple in Jerusalem, it wasn't just for us. It was for the whole world. In fact, we now know that leaders in the ancient world used to make contributions to the temple. Darius, king of Persia, Augustus Caesar from Rome, they all made contributions, which is why when the temple was destroyed and Titus moved in, he took all the wealth that had accumulated in the temple. In fact, there's now information that he used it to finance the building of the Colosseum in Rome. But the point is that we had a universalistic mission, a universalistic appeal, but it was based on a keen understanding of what it means to be a Jew. That's what we did in the past, in our ancient past, and that's what we have to do today. So, true, those of us who serve Israel abroad have to figure out how that mix works. But that's also a subject for you to study here in a day school in Philadelphia. So, again, I appreciate everything you're doing. When I go back to Israel and they ask me, so what did you do in America? I'll say I met incredible people in Philadelphia. And I met a very strong community. And I met you. <laughs> so I want to thank you. I want to thank you for what you do here in making the Jewish people strong, for what you're doing here makes Israel strong. Have a good evening. Thank you, Ambassador Gold, for your service to Israel and for your informative and thought-provoking remarks. And now I would like to call to the podium a Barak alum, Juliet Stein, for a very special announcement in keeping with this evening's theme. Juliet. Thank you, George. 
Good evening. My name is Juliet Stein, class of 2007. If you asked me to give advice to your daughter or son or granddaughter or grandson about MUS, this is what I'd say. No need to pack an umbrella. The market sells chocolate milk in individual plastic bags called Choco Basakit. Limit yourself to one Choco Basakit a day. <laughs> Prank wars will break out in the dorms. Just go with it. The girls will win. The bus rides can be long. Spend that time trying to get your hardened, fresh out of the army madrich to smile. Mount Carmel may be one of your first trips. Over 7,000 years, this area has seen countless battles. The magnitude of standing on this land may not hit you until after you've left Israel. You are still relatively young, and the lessons you will learn will be very old. Yes, that is spreadable chocolate for breakfast. <laughs> the light pollution in the Negev is so low, the Milky Way is easily visible, along with sporadic shooting stars. Take your crush, hold his hand, and watch. When you learn how to say, is there gluten in this? Make sure the local Israelis aren't secretly giving you a string of profanity you will then recite to the shocked waitress. <laughs> when your older cousin takes you to Tel Aviv for Yom Kippur, he may bring you to a beach party for Break the Fast. Just go with it. You will work very hard on your classes. Your dorm will organize study groups, and for the first time, you will experience a new level of responsibility for each other. You will always feel safe. You will be too shy to haggle at first. After a month, you won't be paying full price for anything. <laughs> Dancing down the streets of Jerusalem for Simchas Torah is even better than your second Shoko Basakit of the day. There is an independence that develops only from traveling without your parents. And when the Masada sunrise takes your breath away, let your breath be taken. The experience of MUS is so transformative, we want to ensure that every Barrack student has the opportunity to participate. I am delighted to announce the Jack M. Barrack Hebrew Academy Jewish National Fund Scholarship. Its income will provide scholarships to Barrack students to facilitate their semester at MUS. Jewish National... Oh. <laughs> Jewish National Fund has generously agreed to match contributions to the scholarship, and I'd like to thank Russell Robinson, CEO of JNF, who could not be here tonight. He has the flu. Russell, get well soon and get a flu shot. <laughs> the Max and Bella Stein Foundation has established the scholarship with a pledge of $1 million. JNF will match this pledge for a total starting principal of $2 million. We hope in this way to encourage the next generation of Jewish leaders to love, support, and advocate for Israel. So, to your daughters and sons, and granddaughters and grandsons, I'd say this, at Barak, You'll be offered a semester in Israel. Trust me, just go with it. Thank you. Thank you, Juliet. 
good advice, and I'm glad you ignored my bullet points, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Much better said. Uh, and thank you to the Max and Bella Stein Foundation and the Stein family for your incredible generosity, and to JNF and Russell Robinson, may he recover quickly, um, for the generosity and, and the vision in creating this innovative scholarship fund. Um, that generosity and vision will touch literally hundreds of Barrick students. And success begets success. This generous investment has inspired others to make invest investments in uh, our MUST program, and we hope it continues to do so. Uh, our goal is to continue to grow, uh, work together uh, with JNF, and to continue to grow this um, scholarship fund. And we've also, through the efforts of Sharon and Alex and their team, and Jeff Reddick, our tireless um, board VP overseas development, have raised an additional $200,000 to fund MUST scholarships over the next two years. But, but we're not done. Um, and I hope everyone knows that. Yeah, I, I'm going to ad lib for a second. I don't know if anyone um, noticed in the par shot this week, um, there's a, you know, I, I've struggled with whether to interpret, you know, how much of the, of the Torah to interpret literally and how much of the supernatural um, to take literally. And I, th this, this, this made me struggle. Um, there's a passage in there where those who are, who are responsible for building the Mishkan, they come to Moses and they say, tell the people to stop. We've already gotten enough. We have more than what we need. People can stop donating. Um, we're not there yet. <laughs> but you can help me regain my faith in the literal interpretation of the Torah by getting us there. Before uh, releasing everyone for dessert, I need to thank the army of people who made tonight possible. Um, Sharon and Alex and Randy Buto, Debbie Ricci, Michael Lickman, Marsha Horitz, um, Joan Denenberg. Uh, these folks worked tirelessly, literally around the clock, for the past three months to help make tonight's event so special. So if you see them, please thank them. Um, uh, and please join me in expressing our appreciation for all the hard work that went in tonight, which has been a great night. <laughs>